So welcome to Solid Revisited, the state of the matter. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get to what I mean by that uh, as we go through this. This is actually just based on some ideas I've been noodling around with for a while now. In fact, the last uh, couple of years I've been giving training on TDD in C++, and there's a section in there where I cover the, the solid principles. We'll talk all about solid principles today. And I cheat a bit when I cover that because I, I mostly refer people to Kevin Henney's talk, Solid Deconstruction, where he basically tears down the solid principles and then sort of rebuilds them as the, the, like the essential items. And then I sort of go on to some other things, but I've always thought, yeah, I, I really should do a bit better than that. So this is my attempt to put a bit more flesh on those bones, bring some of my own ideas, incorporate uh, maybe some, some broader perspectives, and also get your ideas. I want to make this a bit more of an open discussion. So there will be some points uh, about halfway through and towards the end where I'm going to ask people for, for their opinions, maybe even bring people into the stream. We'll see how that goes. It's going to be a bit experimental. Um, but I've definitely got some prepared material to, to get through first. I did do this a couple of weeks ago at the, the XTC, that's the Extreme Tuesday Club in London. Of course, it was all online, so we had people from around the world, which was great. I also managed to convince uh, Kevin Henney and Dan North, both of whom I'm going to speak about more today as well, along to that XTC session. So I got their opinions as well, which is really great. Uh, really valuable also to see how their opinions have evolved since some of the things we're going to talk about uh, today, uh, since they first said them. And I've tried to incorporate some of that back into this as well. So I'm st still not sure as I start this how this is going to turn out because I'm going to be very much led by um, feedback as well. So what, what is, what's this all about then? So we mentioned the solid principles. Hopefully if you come along to this session uh, you already have an idea what the solid principles are but I did actually get a, a poll set up which I'm now not able to reach. So uh, I don't know, Jim, can you start that poll? Because um, I just wanted to get an idea of what people's familiarity with solid principles already are. Thanks, Jim. Because most people who have heard of the solid principles maybe even know what some of the names are. Even, even people in the Agile community that I've spoken to struggle to remember all of them, unless they're giving talks on it, of course. Uh, or if they can remember all the names, maybe they're a bit hazy on some of the meanings. And I know I have been, and I've been guilty of this, saying, oh yeah, the single responsibility principle means this, but actually, there's a bit more nuance, a bit more depth to it. And that's one of the things I want to dig into a bit in this. So, see, quite a few responses have come in now. Uh, so 85% of people have voted, that's a good number. Uh, only 6% of people don't know what the solid principles are at all. It's gone down to 5% now. But the majority, well, the, the biggest number, 46%, maybe know some of the solid principles. So that's in line with my expectation. Um, but a, a whopping 36% claim that they know all of the names and meanings. So that's good. So uh, I'm hoping to hear from you <laughs> when we get to the discussion section. 13% um, say they know the names, but probably not all the meanings. So we will cover all of this. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth on each principle. It's going to be more sort of a meta coverage, um, including some of the criticisms um, and some of the alternate views as well. So thanks for that. Um, I think that poll is finished now. Let's, let's get off to a, a solid start. Now, if you were wanting to know more about solid principles, you might do a Google search for solid principles starting out. You might hit this page. It's on uh, Bob Martin's blog, so you probably know the solid principles were, were put together by, by Bob Martin. There's some nuance to that, we'll get to that as well. But most people associate it with, with Bob Martin or Uncle Bob. And you might hit this Bob uh, blog from 2009, where he says that, I'm often asked, how shall I get started with the solid principles? Great, you say, this is what I want. Um, and then he, he says, given the recent interest and controversy about the issue. So even back in 2009, there's a little bit of controversy. But perhaps the most interesting bit here is in the first things first section. 
You can read about the solid principles here. And there's a link. It's a paper I wrote nearly a decade ago, so over 20 years old now. The trouble is, if you follow that link, you'll hit this page. Choose vacation rentals. And actually, you can see the URL has changed to objectmentor.booked.net. Seems to be a bit of a link jacking there. So I think the, the Object Mentor domain no longer owned by um, Bob Martin and others. So, yeah, all those links, most of those links on that page are now broken. Now, of course, we have a solution to that, but you know, this is already not a good sign. We have the, the Wayback Machine, so you can pull up that link from there and you get to this paper, Design Principles and Design Patterns, Robert C. Martin. And it's actually a really interesting paper, it's like a snapshot in time. Um, a lot of this material got rewritten into um, Bob's um, Agile book, which I'll, I'll show a bit of later. But this is sort of uh, a little bit earlier and really sort of shows what he was thinking at the time. And in particular, the principles that he talks about here, in order, are these. I'm not going to say what the full names are at the moment, we'll just go with the abbreviations. So this sort of gives us the Aldeakakas principles, if you really want to try and pronounce that. Uh, not quite as easy to pronounce, but you can see like the first four there are the beginnings of the solid principles. Uh, in fact, if you just take those, you get the oldie principles. So perhaps another sign that these are not the newest things around, but a little bit later, he did add SRP, we'll talk about what it is in a moment, to that list, to get the Soldi principles. So we're still not quite there yet. And in fact, in that Agile book that we uh, that, that I mentioned, if you, if you look in the, um, the second section from chapter seven, what is Agile design, he's got a chapter for each of those still in that order, S-O-L-D-I. But a little bit later, and I'll put some dates on this in a moment, this poster, Principles of OOD, or Principles of OOD, as I like to say it, you can see down there, and I've blurred out the, um, the names again because we're not ready to get there yet, you can see they're actually in the order solid. What happened in the meantime is Michael Feathers had sent him an email and said, you know, if you just rearrange the last two letters, you actually get a, a, a nice word there, a little acronym, solid. Uh, interestingly, in this post, I think it's the first time my seen anything from Bob Martin mentioned in, the, in that order. Um, but he doesn't actually work, mention the word solid on that page. So I think it was a little bit later that he started talking about them as the solid principles. But notice also on that page he's still talking about those other principles as well. So again, still not quite there with right, the solid principles or where it's at. So I mentioned the timeline. So those things we've talked about, design principles and design patterns, was published in 2000. 2002, the book Agile Software Development, it's the title I'm struggling to remember, Principles, Patterns and Practices. I actually seem to remember this coming out in 2001. I thought I had it then, but um, it's actually the end of 2002 and 2003 is the copyright date. So the, the, the principles appeared there, but it was about probably 2004 even Bob Martin doesn't seem to remember uh, absolutely, that the, the acronym SOLID was actually coined. 2005 was that Principles of OOD post I showed you. Uh, and then sometime after that, SOLID principles were, were called that. And the rest, as they say, is history. Although there is some more history, because these were not new principles. They, they may be newly named, but... Uh, Bob himself referred back to earlier work, particularly from 1979, uh, Tom DeMarco's uh, Structured Analysis and System Specification uh, talks about uh, cohesion, which is the, the basis of uh, SRP. Uh, Bertrand Mayer, 1988, Object-Oriented Software Construction, talks about the open-close principle. Uh, Barbara Liskoff, also 1988, Data Abstraction and Hierarchy, Source Material again. Um, the other two principles, by the way, although they are themselves not entirely new, uh, they were given their, their names that we have now um, by 
uh, Robert Martin, between 1994 and 1996, as far as I can work out, in a series of papers. So that's where those principles come in. Interestingly, if you, if you squint, they do actually come in more or less in order. Um, there's a little bit of ambiguity around the second two pairs, but yeah, we, we can we can give that. So that's how we got the solid principles. Um, interesting bit of history there. Some of that will become relevant a little bit later. It's not entirely just an aside. But what are the solid principles? Let's um, let's have a recap because as we as we learned earlier, not everybody knows what all of the principles are. So we have SRP is the single responsibility principle, and the single responsibility principle is this idea that a typically a class, but of course it be a function, a method, uh, a module, uh, or even a, an executable, should have a single well-defined responsibility. There's a little bit of ambiguity around what that responsibility actually is. Um, I'm not going to go too much into depth on this, but I'm going to ask if people want to contribute their understandings of these things a little bit later. There's the open-closed principle that states that, again, these components, whether they're uh, modules, classes, functions, should be um, open for extension uh, but closed for modification. That was uh, the Bert Bertrand Myers principle. The Liskoff substitution principle, so named after Barbara Liskoff, uh, talks about substitutability of types. Uh, we typically interpret that in an OO sense using polymorphism, but actually it was originally stated in the context of um, abstract data types. Very similar, but not quite the same thing. ISP is the interface segregation principle, which is a, a, sort of a much grander name than uh, the words actually suggest. Uh, so small interfaces, again, around well-defined uh, responsibilities. And uh, DIP, DIP, the dependency inversion principle. Not, as some people sometimes slip up and say, the dependency injection principle, although dependency injection frameworks are often associated with dependency inversion, it's not necessarily to use dependency injection in order to achieve dependency inversion. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, now, if you, if you read through that, obviously all of those... Uh, names end in the word principle. They are, after all, the solid principles. But although not one of the principles themselves, even Robert Martin's quite big on uh, dry, don't repeat yourself, a lot of repetition there. So we can we can grey out the word principle. In fact, that word principle itself might be a bit of a problem. We'll come back to that in just a moment. So I mentioned problems a few times. Uh, most people seem to think the solid principles are a good thing, but there's been some criticism. And I've already mentioned this talk from Kevin Henney, Solid Deconstruction. I don't know how many people have actually watched this talk already. Unfortunately, I don't seem to have access to the to the chat right now, so I can't see your... Um, I'm going to have to see if I can... No. Bear with me one second. Okay. Okay, hopefully you can still see my screen. I can now see the chat. So, yeah, maybe you could just indicate in the chat if you've already seen Kevlin's talk. So a few people have seen it, quite a few haven't. So, not necessary to have seen it. In fact, I'm going to draw on a few things that if you've if you've seen it or you know about it already, you'll get a different appreciation from this talk than if you haven't. It may actually be worth going, well, definitely watch this talk afterwards and, and then maybe come back and watch this one and see if you get something different. So we're going to talk about that in a moment, but there's another talk as well from, from Dan North. I mentioned that we'd hear from both of these. Uh, why every single element in solid is wrong. Now, you can't find the actual talk online, just the slides. This was a lightning talk. Um, taking the slides from a lightning talk, it's very easy to uh, get, get the wrong meaning from it. Uh, 
bear in mind it's a lightning talk, meant to be a little bit tongue-in-cheek, with a, a real message at the end. But maybe the title and some of the slides are a little bit over the top. Um, but yeah, some valid points in there. Um, they're both of, both, both Kathleen and Dan have actually proposed alternate acronyms for an alternate set of principles. So Kevlin has proposed the fluid principles. I'll talk about them um, a bit later. Again, that was a lightning talk. Maybe don't take it too seriously. I've always said that it was meant to be tongue in cheek, but actually I heard Kevlin a couple of weeks ago say that um, they were actually meant to be intended seriously. So maybe, maybe there's more in that than I have been reading into it. Now, Dan has, another, has a set of principles as well, but he's only revealed these so far informally in the XTC session. Uh, so I can't actually tell you what the letters are right now. He has promised that he's, well, he's not promised, he said he's going to maybe write them up. So maybe we'll, we'll get to see those principles um, in public sometime soon. Um, we're going to come back to alternate acronyms towards the end of this talk. But let, let's go back into some of the um, some of the points that, that Dan was making in his talk. So it starts with a single responsibility principle, and he calls it the pointlessly vague principle. And this actually this captures a common complaint about most of the solid principles, but particularly this one, that while it's not necessarily wrong, it's just really hard to do anything with because it's just too vague, too broad. What does it really mean? Uh, some questions there. What is a single responsibility anyway? Um, you know, what, why, what happens if you've got three responsibilities instead of one? Uh, how can you actually predict what's going to change? Most of his slides are like this, and he will also propose his own, own alternative, which is to write simple code. Now, somebody's pointed out in a blog post uh, in reply to this, perhaps write simple code is also needlessly um, ambiguous. It's, uh, it's a little bit vague. But it does say at the end, refactor until it fits in your head. This is one of Dan's favourite phrases. It's really good. Um, if you can hold something in your head, it's, it's probably simple enough. If you can't, it's too complex. You need to, to refactor, rework the design. It's a good rule of thumb. Obviously, it's an oversimplification, ironically. But we're going to come back to this idea of simplicity a bit later as well. So while Dan's being dinged a bit for this, I think he's actually onto something. And in fact, it's really his response to all of these principles, right? Simple code. So again, maybe an oversimplification, but valid point. So from Kevin's talk, Again, I'm not going to go through it in too much detail because I do encourage you to, to watch the talk yourself. But we are going to cover some of his points. So I want to summarise. For each of the solid principles, he says, first of all, the single responsibility principle, SRP, um, is really just Tom DeMarco's concept of cohesion or separation of concerns. And... He also argues that both either of those names are actually clearer in terms of what they really mean than the single responsibility principle. You don't have this worrying about what the responsibility is, why you can have only one. It's about separating concerns. And it's about cohesion. What things belong together should go together. If they don't belong together, they shouldn't go together. And that's, I think, much easier to work with. It still requires experience. It still requires a bit of um, a craft. But... At least something you can understand. Uh, he also likes to talk about uh, adhesion as being the opposite of cohesion. So if you stick things together that don't belong together, they're adhering to one another. So it's quite a nice duality, adhesion versus cohesion. Uh, so yeah, I think I can agree with him there that they are probably better terms. The principle itself, though, I think even Kevlin is, is actually quite okay with this. Just really the naming. Uh, this, this is really a, a strong fundamental principle. Open-close principle. Well, it dances around it a bit, but I think it really boils down to use polymorphism and maybe don't publish prematurely 
because if you publish an interface, as in you use it outside of your own code base, then it's much harder to change. But his real problem with OCP is it doesn't seem to make that distinction. It just says that once something is written, you shouldn't change it, you should extend it. Uh, and that's not really the agile way. So is it semantics or is it a real concern? We'll dig into that a little bit more in a while, but we'll, we'll continue with the summary of Kevlin's points. LSP, the Liskov substitution principle. Again, it's about polymorphism with maybe just a little bit of extra care and um, you know due diligence. Actually, he talks about um, contracts as well, that when you use polymorphism, you should also make sure that you um, maintain your invariants and preconditions, postconditions, all your contracts should remain exactly the same uh, regardless of your implementing a polymorphic type. Uh, that, that's really the, the, the key value in, in Liskov substitution is the thing you're substituting should obey all the same contracts. In fact, he even went as far as saying that uh, LSP subsumes contracts because if you obey LSP, then you automatically uh, respect all contracts. So interesting, but ultimately it comes back down to using polymorphism, but carefully. As, uh, ISP, the, uh, the interface segregation principle, this is really just the single responsibility principle or separation of concerns, but applied at the interface level. So it's not really a, a separate principle at all. It's just an application of one that we've already talked about. And given that we are using polymorphism and we should do that using interfaces, but we'll come on to that, then this sort of naturally drops out. So the dependency inversion principle, again, it's really about using polymorphism, but with interfaces rather than inheriting from concrete types. Always inherit from an interface or implement an interface. Um, again, polymorphism, but for interfaces. If you jiggle those about a bit, you sort of come up with this sort of hierarchy. So you've got the, the cohesion, separation of concerns is embodied by SRP and ISP. Using polymorphism, ideally with interfaces and carefully respecting contracts, is a DIP, LSP and OCP. And maybe this extra one, don't publish prematurely because then you're you know, locking yourself in to limited change is really just the domain of OCP. So you can at least boil them down to those three. And that, that was really Kevin's main point is that there's a lot of redundancy between these principles, a lot of um, overlap. Uh, and maybe they don't really need to be fully separated out into the five principles. He has other concerns as well, or we'll come to some of them, but that's the main point. So by the end of, of this talk, when I was watching it, I, I was finding that I didn't, didn't agree with everything that he said. Some of it, absolutely. Got lots of interesting points, lots of interesting asides as well. Definitely watch uh, the, the talk if you haven't seen it already. But I didn't agree with, with all of it. And in fact, towards the end of the talk, this is the, the NDC London version, there's another version as well. He actually said, so he's expecting you to, to disagree with him. Uh, you, you'll get this a lot with Kevin's talks. They're meant to make you think, not necessarily to do the thinking for you. So it's typical of that. A lot of his critics have missed that point, I think. So the talk is not really saying that the solid principles are completely wrong, or that they have no value. Um, it's just saying that there's a bit more to it. And there's different layers. Uh, he also talks about um, it being sort of a more of a, a, a beginner level um, approach to, to follow the solid principles. But later, you start to understand the, the relationships between the principles and, and get a high level of understanding. So not necessarily something that an expert would be following to the letter, if you pardon the pun. Uh, and also that his thoughts wouldn't necessarily be yours. They're, they are his thoughts and opinions designed to make you think. Uh, 
Interestingly, this frame that uh, we're seeing here from the talk, you can see a uh, photo of a book that he happens to be co-author of, but Kevin does like to take photos of books and put them in his talks, whether they're his books or somebody else's books. Uh, and I, I've been following him doing that for years, and I, I quite like the idea myself. As it happens, at this conference that he was at, NDC London, I think I was actually, maybe the following talk, or later the same day, I was giving a talk in the same room. And as it happens, in that talk, I mentioned that Kevin Knight's taking photos of books, or that I wanted to do that, but the trouble was, I didn't really read many physical books anymore, so instead I took a photo of my iPad with the book that I was talking about, and I showed that instead. This is also interesting because that talk was a talk on simplicity, uh, which, as we mentioned when we were talking about Dan North's uh, lightning talk earlier, Dan thought that writing simple code was really the essence of what the solid principles were trying to get at. And I sort of agree with him, and I go into it in much more depth in that talk. And we're going to come back to that um, a little bit later today as well. Okay, so that's the the criticisms, the uh, well, the, the two talks that I wanted to, to draw on. But there are some other uh, thoughts that you can find uh, people talking about uh, problems with the solid principles, um, some that I've thrown in myself, some that came up from the discussion at XTC the other week. So I've got a set of possible issues with the solid principles here. We'll go into some of these a bit, and then we're going to come back and, and maybe open up for discussion to see what other people think, whether they agree, disagree, or have their own concerns. So first of all, and Kevlin particularly made this claim, that they're not actually principles. So Kevlin actually took a quote from the, the Oxford English Dictionary. I uh, found something similar from the Cambridge Dictionary. Points out that the word principle basically means that uh, something is a basic truth or an idea or rule that explains or controls how something happens. There's one meaning truth or, or a hard rule, or a, a moral rule of good behaviour. And his argument was that neither of those things apply to the solid principles. They're not rules, they're not laws, they're not absolute truths, and they say nothing about morality. So are they really principles? And Kevin argues not. In fact, he prefers to call them either patterns or guidelines. Uh, now, interestingly, that paper from, from early on, from, uh, from Bob Martin, talked about principles and patterns. He went on to talk about some design patterns as well. And design patterns have a, definitely a different feel to these. These do seem to be something different. They're related, but not the same. The reason I picked the Cambridge Dictionary here is because there's another definition in there or a side comment, uh, talking about in principle, if you agree with or believe something in principle, you agree with the idea in general, although you might not support it in reality or in every situation. This seems to be a much better fit for what we're talking about with the solid principles. Whether you agree with them or not individually, what we actually mean by principle here is something that, yeah, something you broadly agree with in general, but might not support it in every situation, in reality. I think that's a good fit. So I'm actually a bit more happy with the word principle here. Although I can see where Kevin's coming from, I don't think in practice um, this is a real problem that people have. I don't think people are misled by the solid principles because of the use of the word principle. That's not one of the problems that it has, in my opinion. In fact, Bob himself. Back in that getting a solid start post that we looked at earlier, has a section, what do I mean by principle? So you know, what he actually meant in the use of the word. The solid principles are not rules, they're not laws, and they're not perfect truths. The statements on the order of an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's a good principle, it's good advice, but it's not a pure truth, and nor is it a rule. So 
exactly those things that Kevlin said was the definition of principle. He's saying, no, that's not what I mean here. This is what I mean. And the fact that the Cambridge Dictionary does seem to support this alternate definition of the word principle, and that most people seem to accept it without complaining, I think gives us a pass on this one. But I'm not going to let them off the hook that easily. I think there is still a problem here. It's not necessarily the word principle. But if we go on, in that same section, it goes on to say that the principles are mental cubbyholes. They give a name to a concept so that you can talk and reason about that concept. Naming something is really useful. As it says, you know, it gives, gives you the ability to talk about it. In a way, a name is an abstraction for a thing. Abstractions are ways that we can chunk information so we can talk about something as a single unit without having to talk about everything from first principles all the time. Really useful in that way. We use it, use names for that reason all the time. But they can also be dangerous because once you give something a name and you stop thinking about the details, you can have a tendency to forget the details or forget their relevance or maybe not even learn them in the first place. And I see this a lot when it comes to things like the solid principles. People may have a high level view of what a name means, but not really be aware of what was actually discussed. And then the flip side to this is, well, if you're going to give something a name, you need to give it a good name. Something that actually suggests what it is that it's a name for. And I think this is also a valid criticism of the solid principles. Most of those names are not actually that good. Which sort of leads us on to our next problem, that they are not accessibly named, uh, by which I mean just by looking at them, some to a greater degree than others, you can't really uh, get an understanding of what the principle means until you go off and see the discussion. So the um, single responsibility principle, this is the one that uh, Dan North argued was pointlessly vague. It, it's fairly simple in meaning, but it's too broad to really do something with. As uh, We talked about cohesion being a better name, uh, and in fact that's what it was based on anyway, or separation of concerns, uh, or as Dan proposes, and I do as well, simplicity. Uh, we'll come back to that a bit later. The open-close principle. You know, what, what does it relate to? Does, we're talking about classes, modules, functions. The way that uh, well, Martin talks about it sounds very much um, to do with classes and class hierarchies. But actually, um, Mayer, Bertrand Mayer was talking about classes, modules, and even functions. And also, what does extension mean when, when he says that they should be open to extension? Is he talking about inheritance? Or is he talking about something else? So, lots of questions there that, you know, the, the name actually raises more questions than it, than it answers. You really have to dig into the subject to really know what it's about, which is one of the problems here. Perhaps the worst one is the Liskov substitution principle. It's named after a person, which is fine, but of course it tells you nothing about it. It's got the word substitution in there. Maybe that tells you a bit, but again, you, you really have to do quite a bit of reading to say, ah, that's what it is. Interface segregation principle, it's straightforward enough, but it's, again, it's a, it's a much grander name than it needs to be. It, for a fairly simple principle that itself is a derivation of the other principles anyway. And then the dependency inversion principle. Again, a really simple principle with a name that's almost obfuscating it. Really, you can say this is just about um, using polymorphism with interfaces. Program to an interface, I think, is a better name. There's another problem here. Anybody know what this is a picture of, if you're still watching? No idea, says Dimitri. <laughs> upside down glasses. It is actually upside down glasses. What are they for? They are prison based. But wh why would you wear upside down glasses? What's this all about? Seeing the world the other way up? Okay. So you, you probably heard the, the claim, which apparently is true, that if you wear glasses like these, 
for a few days uh, to show the brain can quickly adjust to anything. Getting there, yeah. After a few days of wearing these glasses, you will actually start to see everything the right way up again. And in fact, because our eyes are wired to our brains upside down. The brain sees everything upside down. And the claim is that when we're first born, we see the world upside down for a few days. And then the brain corrects. And then we go for the rest of our lives seeing everything the right way up. Until you put these glasses on. And after a few days, it flips again. Once you get used to it, which is uh, really amazing when you think about it. But it also shows that what we mean by inversion is context dependent. I mean, if you put these glasses on and you see the world the whole way up, well, you're inverting something that was already inverted. So maybe now you're seeing everything the right way up. Why is, what's this got to do with anything? Well, the dependency inversion principle has the word inversion in there because it's inverting what we did previously. Previously, people, and they still do it, of course, but there was much common more common approach to depend on concrete implementations. And we wanted to invert that and say, no, we want to depend on interfaces instead. The trouble is we sort of moved on from that. And now, depending on interfaces where we can, is just sort of what we do. So inverting that would actually be going back to depending on concrete implementations. So it's a bit of a problematic name because it's, it's context dependent dependent on that point in time. So, yeah, naming is hard. Good naming, doubly so. Moving on to the next problem. Internal redundancies. This was Kevlin's sort of big point. He spends most of his talk going into this. Uh, and this is that sort of recategorization from, from the earlier slide. Um, Again, it can be a bit uh, context sensitive. You know, have, have we moved on from needing to discuss the value of, of smaller interfaces? Um, are we already thinking about cohesion? Isn't it better to just teach interface-based polymorphism rather than, you know, dependency injection principle, LSP and OCP? So, you know, maybe we've moved on from um, needing to to treat these things separately, and just go to those those core underlying principles. But on the other hand, there are still some details in there that maybe we're overlooking. We already touched on some of them. The open close principle. So we tend to think of it as being about using polymorphism and inheritance to to extend classes or extension methods to extend uh, functions and methods. But it also talks about published interfaces. So that's really the distinction is once something is published, once it makes its way outside of your code base, that's when you need to start to treating it differently. And therefore, you want to delay that point to as late as possible. That's the implication. So just saying, well, this is just about polymorphism, maybe dismisses some of those nuances. Again, LSP, Liskov Substitution Principle, it's not just polymorphism, it's particularly about the relationship to contracts that, again, often gets missed in the discussion. And all of these things are really the, primarily about managing dependencies rather than object hierarchies and so on. And that's something that maybe we're, we're missing in the discussion sometimes. So maybe it's not the best grouping now, but I don't think we should actually throw out some of those nuances just by boiling it down to those simple categorizations. Maybe we'll come back to that point. So are they outdated? Uh, one of uh, Kevin's claims about the open close principle was particularly about this close for modification side to it. And his, his point here, and it has some merit, is that uh, Bertrand Mayer coined the open close principle back in the 80s. And in those days, the most popular version control system was nothing. 
So the idea of changing your code had a very different implication to what it does today, even before we started embracing change with the Agile movement. Now, not only do we have version control, but if we're doing things like test-driven development or otherwise have a big um, test code base, we're actually much more free to make changes. In fact, we literally embrace change. We know things are going to change. We design for change. So this whole idea of close for modification sounds outdated when you put it that way. But again, it's, it's really in that context of don't publish prematurely. You should feel free to change things that are within your code base, but once they are published beyond, beyond that, that point, even if it's just to the next team, you have to think about things differently. If it's published to the outside world, you have to think about it differently again. That's what the open close principle is about. So is it outdated? In some respects, yes, but broadly, no, I would say. Dependency injection principle. Again, was it a reaction to the, to the prior state of the art? Um, bear in mind, talking about dependency management, and this was particularly in the context of C++ at the time, with its uh, hash include uh, dependency approach, pulling in all the text from files and putting them into your translation unit. That's a big um, impact on particularly the build times but also namespace pollution and lots of other problems with that, which we still have today. But not everyone, not everyone is doing C++. And most languages that people have moved on to don't have that problem, at least not in such a big way. And even C++ is starting to, to come around to, to dealing with this issue. Maybe from a dependency management perspective, it's not such a big deal, but Dependency management is always going to be with us. It's not just about injecting the source code. It is about managing the dependencies themselves and the fragility of how you construct your, your architecture in, in general. So the um, did I say dependency injection earlier? Dependency inversion principle is still valid. Again, it may be context dependent. In, in C++, ironically, the one that has the hash include problem um, doesn't tend to make big use of interfaces, not, not as much. So maybe it's not used in quite the same way in C++. Maybe it should be more. This is an open question. Um, Dittmar is asking, what, what do you mean moved on to? Um, I've, I've forgotten the context that I said that in now. So maybe you can ask that again. Moving from C, oh, um, when I was talking about languages. So these principles were formulated in the context of C++ originally, but many people have moved on from C++ to other languages, whether that's C Sharp or Java or Rust or Kotlin or Swift, Ruby, Python, most languages are together more popular than C++ these days. There's still a lot of C++. I'm still a C++ developer, but not everybody is. And particularly for those that are following the solid principles, I think was my main point. Okay. So that there may be some other um, points of the principles that can be considered and updated, but I think we can go through the same process. Overall, they, they mostly still stand up. Maybe just not quite the same way they were originally formulated. What about being language specific? Um, list cost substitution principle, for example. How does that apply to dynamic languages? Well, as we said, it's really about contracts. Contracts still apply. If your, um, if your object uh, talks like a duck, uh, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, um, but doesn't behave like a duck, <laughs> maybe it's not a duck. The contracts still apply. So I think we can still still apply LSP there. Um, we mentioned a mismatch maybe between 
the dependency inversion principle, get that right, and C and C++'s hash include model. Um, as we've already said, dependency management is still important. It's not just about textual inclusion. It's about the actual lines of dependency between, between things and whether those are locked in or whether they are things that are easy to change. And interface segregation principle. Again, in C++, these days especially, interfaces, as in pure abstract base classes, they're used, but they're maybe not the, um, the lingua franca of the language. That's something you might see in some, case, some circumstances, but not others. But when they are used, the, the interface segregation principle still very much applies. We want to keep our interfaces simple and focused. And we're not just talking about these polymorphic interfaces. It applies just as readily to uh, type, in, type erasure types uh, and also concepts. So compile time interfaces and concepts is the latest way that we do that in C++. There may be other languages that have similar ideas. ISP still applies. It's, it's, again, it's more about simplicity, focus, separation of concerns, cohesion. Those underlying principles are, are still valid. So the principles may apply in slightly different ways to different languages, but they still apply, largely. But maybe, maybe the principles are OO specific and that they are often coloured as such, and that they, in fact they are painted as object-oriented design principles. And I think this one maybe has a bit more to it, if we try to apply them to functional languages, I would argue, maybe you have a different idea, ISP and DIP are a bit less relevant, not completely valueless, but less relevant. But OCP, open close principle, still very much applies to, to the data model, even if we don't really have the same sorts of interfaces. SRP still applies to functions. Functions should be about doing one, one thing well um, in a cohesive way, even if there's multiple operations in there. LSP still applies to substitutable types. Again, even if not, you're not using OO style inheritance, LSP itself was, was formulated in the context of um, abstract data types, not OO. Uh, Jonathan Tanner is saying ISP is pretty relevant to functional languages when we have things like type classes. Yeah, exactly. So in some ways, it's even more applicable to, to a functional language or, or other types of languages outside of OO. Uh, I haven't drawn up one of these lists for every other paradigm, but functional languages are usually the ones held up as being, yeah, Solid principles don't really apply, they're, they're an OO thing. But actually, if you go through, most of it's still relevant. Some of it even more so. But, again, may, maybe... Um, oh, it's ISP you were talking about, sorry. I thought that was LSP. Uh, ISP is still pretty relevant to functional languages when we have things like type classes. Okay, yeah, I get you now, yeah. So, type classes being like concepts in a way. So... Uh, compile time interfaces. All right, I have talked for quite a while. Um, I've said what I think, and we're already getting a bit of conversation going in the chat. I think it's a good time to open this up for broader discussion. Now I've got you warmed up. I'm going to put those objections, issues back up on the screen, and. Does anybody in the chat have anything they actually want to say on the mic? So Jonathan's raised his hand um, and I don't have my participants window to, to bring him up. Uh, Jim, are you able to give Jonathan the mic? Um, okay, so the... Uh, have you seen Phil Wadler, who presented something that he calls the expression problem? I don't think I've seen that by Phil Wadler. Okay, so, so this is the idea um, 
I quote the, the goal. Ba- I, I won't quote it. It's slightly hard to understand. Basic the way he says it. Basically, we have. Let's say we're discussing shapes, and a shape could be a square or a circle. Yeah. Uh, in the OO way, we would normally we would make it very easy to define a new type of shape, but very hard to add a new a new function to all the shapes, because you'd have to find everywhere that you've defined a shape. Whereas if you do it in the functional style, usually it's the other way around. We would, you'd, if you want to add a new shape, you would have to go to every function that deals with shapes. But if you want to just add a new function that can deal with shapes, that's very easy. Um, and so I, I've always seen this as kind of looking at the open close principle. The open close principle seems to be prioritizing one of those over the other um, in terms of because it, it is very hard. There are languages that have tried, but it's very hard to, to have a language where you can both add a new type of shape as well as add a new function to every shape. Um. Yeah, so um, I'm glad you brought this up. This was something that I'd been, as I was putting this material together, I kept sort of coming up against this, this particular question. Um, I wasn't aware of um, Phil Wadler's take on it. I'm going to have to I've made a note to look that up. But yeah, this comes up in a few ways, and the uh, the solution is usually um, they're called multi methods. So the the ability to write functionality that's polymorphically dependent on more than one type. Um, visitors just being brought up in the chat is what we usually do instead, which is like a um, not not so good version of that. Uh, we're getting better at it, but in most languages there is this tension between do you have open polymorphism, which is uh, better for adding new types, but not so much for adding new functionality, or something either visitor-based or um, um, like pattern matching-based, where it's easier to add new functionality but harder to add new types. I usually come down in favour of pattern matching approaches being better because languages that have good support for that will usually also have good support for telling you at compile time uh, when you're missing uh, a new, when you're missing um, the application of a new case to a, an existing type. So yeah, you have to do a bit of work to go go through and do it, but um, but you can do it. It, it will actually tell you at compile time. Whereas multi methods, I've not actually seen a um, uh, that really working in the real world. I haven't used a language that has uh, support for that, so I don't know how well that works in practice. So. Uh, Interesting to see what Phil Waddler's take would be because he's definitely um, got more experience with those sort of languages than I have. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's um, definitely one of the tensions that are, are relevant here. Um, I think somebody else had a hand up earlier. I can't see them now. Maybe, um, Jim, if you can see your hands up, you could rotate somebody in. Oh, here we go. Lucien? And then Ian? I'm not sure if you've seen uh, an article of mine that appeared in Overload, I think, April last year, uh, uh, Deconstructing Inheritance. And in that article, I was speaking on some, um, specifically on this called substitution principle. Uh, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that if you look really hard at any of these principles, uh, you find a lot of um, inconsistencies because you're not working with some very well-defined quantities. You're not working uh, with the mathematically defined uh, uh, entities. You're just working with very broad concepts. Uh, so yeah, what, what does Liskov mean? I actually have a very kind of a tentative proof to show that it's completely inapplicable. Um, and if you look at the other principles, it's kind of like that way with everything. Um, what, what a single responsibility principle means. Uh, what does uh, coherence means? I actually have a couple of months back, I drew on my table some, some idea for an article that I want to write. You can't, you can't properly figure out what coherence means. It can mean various different things depending on the context you're, you're looking at. So I think that the bottom line that I'm getting at is 
partially, if you're looking from the right context, each of these principles, or however you want to call them, have some merit. But if you look really hard enough to them, they, they probably don't make sense. Thank you. And thanks for mentioning your overload article. I'm going to look at that. I haven't seen that already. Interesting you picked on the Liskov substitution principle as being one that um, can't be expressed mathematically, because it's the only one that does actually seem to, at least, be expressed mathematically, but obviously not rigorously, I suppose is your your point there. Um, and, yeah. Right. Right, that's true. Um, I'm going to have to think about that a little bit more, but I, I get your point. Um, and I, maybe this is why there is this feeling that amongst functional programmers that solid principles don't apply to functional programming because there isn't that sort of mathematical rigor behind them. Um, but I don't think anybody's ever claimed that there there is, which is why I think Kevlin uh, prefers to call them guidelines. They're, they're more sort of human things like touchstones that you can say, yeah, are we, are we doing this? Um, and you can sort of get an idea whether you're doing it or not and whether you need to be doing it. But it's not something you can specifically define in a rigorous mathematical way, I agree. Um, there are things in programming that you can do that with, but these these sort of things I don't think... I'm not sure you, there is a way to boil these sort of things down to rigorous mathematical approaches. So Jonathan's saying, Kevlin pointed out that adding logging changes observable behaviour, so technically violates LSP. Yes, yeah, that's one of his points. Um, and it, it does, and this falls into something that Kevlin also says about a strict interpretation of LSP, being, yes, you can't even add something cross-cutting like logging. logging. Whereas there's a more relaxed LSP that would let you do that, even though it's not strict LSP, because most people would still find that useful. Um, but then you have to say, are we still honouring contracts if we do that? And can we fail for different reasons now? And that sort of thing. Uh, and that's really what most people don't consider when they think of LSP is, is the contract. So really that's that's most of it when you think of it that way. Uh, any Anyone else got any more thoughts, observations? Um, getting some good things to follow up on so far though. So I'm going to give you all a bit more time to um, to think about that. We can come back to this. I've got some more slides to go back to. Uh, so I've sort of sprung you on, on this on you a bit. So if you've got more to, to say a bit later, we can, we can revisit it. Talking of revisiting, let's revisit Solid Revisited. Um, so I had a subtitle, The State of the Matter. A bit of a play on words because solid is a state of matter, so other people have tried to come up with, with different acronyms that um, also boil down to, if you pardon the pun, states of matter. So Kevlin came up with the fluid principles. I've also seen the liquid principles. Um, I'd seen others as well. I couldn't seem to find them when I was putting this slide together. So I did note that actually technically fluid is not really a state, uh, not not just one state because gases are also fluids, whereas liquid is a is a distinct state. Um, shock from Jason Gorman, Emily says. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> Another one to note. Um, these alternates are not necessarily meant to be taken too seriously. Uh, as I said earlier, it turns out Kevlin did mean fluid a bit more seriously than I had thought. It's worth having a look at those. Um, most of these are, I, I think are really useful. These are on a very different level to, to the solid principles, and I think in a more useful way. Uh, he favours code that's, that's functional. Again, it doesn't mean that all code has to be functional, just a, that sort of approach that he favours where, where it applies. Uh, loose says in loose coupling, so that's really the, the essence of SRP. Unit testable is an interesting one, because it's a bit cyclic, because 
writing code that's unit testable tends to make the code unit testable. Or rather, writing code from a unit test makes it unit testable. The, the thing here is that you actually tend to get many of the other uh, valuable properties almost for free when you do it that way. Uh, introspective. Um, that's an interesting one. I think that's becoming more important. Um, and we're going to see, particularly in the next generation of, of C++, I think, uh, a much more important role to introspection in the language. Um, the last one, I think, we'll have to give him, I think he's reaching a bit for for the final letter. But yeah, idempotent. Um, I'm not sure we can take that one as seriously. Um, and then the liquid principles. These ones definitely not meant to be taken seriously. This is more like a, like an anti <laughs> uh, anti solid. So yeah, large files, long classes, and methods, interdependencies. Um, everything is a quagmire. Undocumented, illegible code, duplicate code. So definitely not not dry. But there is a um, a state of matter that we, we haven't mentioned, that's gas, although we did say that fluid includes gases. Um, I couldn't find anyone that had actually used gas as an acronym for uh, design principles, but maybe maybe a code that makes too much use of getters and setters. Maybe can come up saying better. But there's actually more states of matter than those three. There's plasma, of course. That's a promising one. We'll come back to that. But then it turns out, if you look on Wikipedia, there are many other more exotic states of matter. I did try to get the Bose-Einstein condensate principles, but I didn't get very far with that one. Maybe you can come up with something from one of those lists, but I'm actually going to go with the plasma principles. I think that we can get something there. So this is what I came up with. Um, I didn't spend that long on this, so again, it's not meant to be taken too seriously. If anything, this is this is a, a good exercise just to see, you know, what sort of principles or um, approaches do you find important that you could squeeze into some arbitrary letters? <laughs> and, and what do you come up with? And are they better than solid principles, at least for the way you work? So these ones resonate with me. So uh, persistence. I'm not talking about like file persistence or databases. I'm talking more like persistent data structures. So like this um, simple binary tree. If you, um, if you want to mutate an element in that tree, maybe add a new element, you can create a copy of one of the branches up to root with the new element added. So it's linked back to the original tree. So the original tree persists, it hasn't changed. So you have the illusion of mutability or we, the mutability is just in one place. It's controlled mutability. Uh, just enough mutability, if you like. Only you keep the original state around for as long as you need it. Uh, lots of advantages to this. Uh, very low overhead most of the time. Um, I've done a whole talk on that. But I find it a very useful way of thinking about things. Uh, maybe as a stand-in for just preferring immutable data in the first place. Local reasoning, similarly, a very sort of a functional approach to things. This is really about, um, comes back to Dan North's idea of um, what things fit in your head. Local reasoning is being able to look at a small piece of code and read about everything in that code without having to take everything, all, the, all of the rest of the code into account. So as an example, again, from another one of my talks, if you take... Simple bit of code like this. We introduce a variable, and then depending on some con condition, we'll set that variable to, to some new value. Seems really simple. And you think, yeah, I can understand that bit of code in isolation. The trouble is, in order to achieve this, we've had to rely on side effects, changing the state of a variable. Um, and as a result of that, we can't make that variable const or immutable. It has to be a mutable variable. And so for the lifetime of that variable, in order to reason about its state, we have to look at all the lines of code that it goes through. We can't just consider the point of declaration. Whereas if we changed it to something like 
uh, this. Now, this is not um, C++. This is like a an expression-oriented C++. We could do it with a ternary operator, but um, a, a functional language will let you write something very similar to this, where you uh, actually assign a value from the result of the conditional. So there's no mutability going on here. We're actually setting the value up front. We can now make it const. As a benefit, we can make it um, use a, a type inference as well. Much cleaner. And now we can apply local reasoning because we know that once that color is set, it's not going to change. Seems like a trivial example, but most of the time we, we brush the, the consequences of mutability under the carpet and say so it's just the cost of doing business. But once you start using an immutable approach to things and being able to apply local reasoning, you start to see all the guarantees that gives you and you, you really can't go back. Or you can, but you do it kicking and screaming. Um, you don't want a semicolon in the middle because it's all supposed to be one statement, right? Uh, yes, that is true. This is pseudocode, so <laughs> don't get too hung up on that. Um, yeah, if you, if you wrote it using the ternary operator, you wouldn't need the um, semicolons anyway. But you can't... The trouble with the ternary operator is it doesn't scale up uh, beyond Boolean conditions, at least not in any reasonable way. What you can do... Ah, somebody's mentioned it. Immediately invoke lambdas. <laughs> It's, it's not true um, expression-oriented code, but it's uh, sort of fake expression-oriented code. You put, say, a switch statement inside an immediately invoked lambda expression, and you return out of it. So yes, you will have a, a semicolon because it is a statement, return statement, but because it's the end of the return statement, you'd never actually see the, uh, the side effect. Um, agreed, it's a hack. Yeah. Okay, I could say a lot more about this, but we're already on an aside. Uh, algorithms. Really, this is just Sean Parent, who's actually up next, uh, and he's uh, no raw loops, use algorithms instead. Learn your algorithms. Um, we, there's no excuse these days. There's great resources out there to help you to get a, an intuition for algorithms, as, as Connor Hextra likes to say. Uh, do it. Learn your algorithms. Um, you'll just feel more in control of your code when you do that. Uh, again, you're reducing the need for mutability and side effects and um, complexity in the code that doesn't need to be there because you can push that onto um, the language and libraries. Again, another big topic. Go and watch Sean Perrin's talk if you haven't. If you have and you haven't seen it recently, go and watch it again and watch um, Connor's talks uh, as well as others. Use algorithms. Simplicity. Really, again, most of most of my principles here come back to simplicity. So again, non-orthogonal. I did a whole talk on this, seeking simplicity. Um, I should have actually uh, didn't get to put a, a link to a page on my website that has all the references from this talk, including links to these talks. I'll try and put that up afterwards and um, post it in Discord. Um, so I'll post a link to this talk. But this talk is really a riff off a talk by um, Rich Hickey, uh, Simple Made Easy. If you haven't seen that either, do watch that. Really, it's getting to the essence of what simplicity actually is and what complexity actually is. And once you understand that, everything else sort of drops out of it. Uh, really, it's just talking about... Um, Things that cross over, or things that are interwoven or, or braided, is the is the term. And when you think of code, we can see how mutability makes code complex because um, every line of code interacts with every other line, every other line of code. Whereas when you have immutability and values can't change, then that value doesn't interact with anything else. That's one example. You can read other things into it like uh, threading, um, dependency management, again, the solid principles are all about dependency management. Simplicity is all about minimizing things that interact, including dependencies. Uh, so that, that was quite a big talk. You should go and watch that. <laughs>
Um, abstractions was the next one. I forgot to put the intermediate slide in. Um, for that same talk, I mentioned I talked about abstractions in there as well. And I put up this quote from Joel Spolsky. All non-trivial abstractions, to some degree, are leaky. And you could actually take out the bits in grey. And I think the statement is stronger and maybe even more accurate. All abstractions are leaky. It's just a question of how leaky. And this sort of brings to mind another famous quote from, from George Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. The point here with abstractions is abstractions are one of our key weapons in the fight against complexity. But they're also often one of the key culprits as well because of the leaky abstraction problem. When you have an abstraction that leaks, you now have both the abstraction itself and the thing it's abstracting interacting with each other, which, as you said, was the definition of complexity. So we want to minimise that, but we can't make our abstractions watertight. So my approach, which I go into a bit more depth in my other talk, is we keep our abstractions as small and simple as possible where we can, but then we have to make a decision. Is it going to be a global abstraction? And by that I mean things like, is it a language or a, um, a widely used library, something that has at least multiple users? We have to put that extra effort into making it as complete and watertight as possible. You'll never be completely watertight, but that's the aim, so that you can rely on the abstraction. Versus a local abstraction that you just use in your own code base. My slightly controversial claim is that you should actually embrace the leakiness. Don't try to abstract too much. Abstract just enough to be a unit of organisation, but not to create a whole metaphor, which is what we often get caught up in doing. That's what introduces unnecessary complexity in your code. Allow the leakiness to to show so that when you're trying to work something out, you don't have to fight through layers of abstractions unnecessarily. I know it's a little bit controversial. I'm uh, certainly willing to, to discuss that further. But that's my plasma principles. And that's the end of my slides. I see there's been a bit more discussion going on as well. Um, Jonathan Tanner's got some gas principles. Crockable, abstractable, and sane. Um, immutability is the future, says Marvin Jones, not just because of the second law. Um, Matthew Brechton. Perhaps it's part of the SRP principle, but one thing I look for is an evenness to the abstraction level within a class. Yeah, so that sort of counterpoint to what I was saying about local abstractions, we may have to fight our way through multiple levels of abstraction. That's where the complexity really adds up. Yeah, if you keep to um, low levels of abstraction layers, then it, it's, it's easier. I think we're saying the same sort of thing. Um, yes, yeah, some, some good stuff going going on there. So that's the end of my material. Um, I've got my website up there. Oops, that, a bit premature. Put that back up. Levelofendirection.com, where you will find when I put it up, all the references from this talk. If you can't remember levelofindirection.com, I also have, also have extra levelofindirection.com that redirects there, of course. Or you can catch me on Twitter, Phil underscore Nash, or I'll be in the Discord for a while. But I wanted to open it up again to see if anybody had any more thoughts on either the, the problems we talked about earlier or any of the things we talked about since. Or have any other questions? Uh, do you, people think about OCP mostly in terms of inheritance in OO rather than it being provided by composition? My experience is that it's usually framed in terms of inheritance, but that's not how it was originally formulated. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that Kevlin didn't like about it was that um, uh, Bertrand Mayer specifically mentioned uh, functions as well, being subject to the open closed principle. And he said, how can you extend a function? And I think that really depends on how you think about it. So I've suggested 
to him that you could you can extend the function by having it take a lambda. So it does something around a lambda that it calls in the middle. Um, he seems to think that's not extending it. I think that that's a matter of semantics. Um, and there's other ways as well. Um, don't know what you think about that, but but I think the idea of extending functions is an interesting one. But certainly it's not limited to um, extending classes for inheritance. Uh, and in fact, my lightning talk the other day talked about uh, extension methods, extending existing classes by adding new methods could also be an application of the open close principle. Uh, decorators in Python um, presume is another way to do open close principle, extending uh, classes, is that right? Method extension. Yeah, so most languages, many languages, uh, have some, some way to add methods. Yeah, can extend functions in Emacs, Lisp with advice. You can do most things in Lisp, can't you? Um, anyone have more, more questions or comments on any of the, the issues? Still keen to have more discussion on that. So is monkey patching applying OCP at runtime? Uh, I think it is. It's um, it's a different application. And I, I think the, the published interface part of it doesn't really apply there. But it's certainly extending. Another meaning of solid. System of leveraging interesting designs. <laughs> nice one, Ian. Co-worker complained to me the other day about there's just layers and layers of abstractions. Where's the functional part? And you're welcome to steal the bit about leakiness. Yeah, that that is one thing I found is abstractions are really useful when, when applied well, especially to things that have broad application. But the temptation to add abstractions for the sake of it or to try to represent some sort of metaphor is really the cause of some of the biggest complexity I've seen. It's such a double-edged sword. Okay, I'm still not seeing anybody with any more thoughts on the, the problems with solid. Maybe I should have given you more warning about that. Are there any other questions at all? Otherwise, we can probably wrap up a few minutes early.